Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Mei Li Chen, and I will be presenting on a rhetorical analysis of the rights of nature in Christian and American legal texts. I am a senior studying biology with a specialization in ecology and conservation biology. So show of hands, how many of you have seen or read the Dr. Seuss film and book, The Lorax? OK, most of you. But for those of you that aren't aware, uh, it's a story that centers the titular character in which he advocates for nature in a forest that is being exploited. And his famous lines are, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And so this rhetoric is regarding saying that these environmental objects or natural objects have rights and that the Lorax, as someone who can speak, advocates for them. And this rhetoric is very similar to an international legal movement that is growing called the rights of nature. Since 2006, uh, countries as well as smaller municipalities of the world have implemented this legal movement through two different methods. Firstly, countries like New Zealand and India have implemented laws that grant legal personhood to specific natural objects like rivers, while countries like Ecuador have granted nature broad rights on the whole. Uh, these may contain language like, natural communities and ecosystems possess inalienable and fundamental rights to exist and flourish. So I was interested in studying the rights of nature in the United States, which currently does not have this movement on a national level. So to do this, I decided to conduct a rhetorical analysis of primary sources for two subjects, the first being the American federal legal system and the second being Christianity. Now, the American federal legal system is, of course, our dominant set of laws, our supreme set of laws that govern us, while Christianity represents the dominant religion in the United States, as 63% of US adults identify as Christian, and 41% of adults in the US of any religion consider it very important in their lives, compared to only 33 saying not important. And both uh, the American federal legal system and Christianity are ripe with texts about the environment suitable for rhetorical analysis. So my main research questions were regarding the rights of non-sentient nature, these being land, air, water, and plants, compared to animals. And so my question was, do Christianity and the legal system value non-sentient natural objects? And if they do value them, how and why? Who assigns this value, being man, the divine, et cetera? So there are two concepts that are important to my project, and the first is anthropocentrism. This is the idea that humans and their interests, goods, and values are the most important in a moral evaluation. So for instance, human values could be anything from sustainability to profit, human goods, anything from timber to other products that we produce. And so this anthropocentrism is the idea that our interests, as opposed to natural objects' interests or others, are more important. So the rights of nature would not further an anthropocentric value, but instead an ecocentric approach. The second concept that's important is stewardship. And this occurs in both secular and religious contexts. It's the idea that uh, of sustainable, responsible care and management of possessions that are not one's own. So now I will turn to explicate a Christian text. So Laudato Si is a papal encyclical by Pope Francis from 2015, and it is in regards to the environment and saying that we as humans, as well as other Christians, should advocate for the environment and pursue sustainable practices. This quote is from a section on biodiversity loss, and it reads, we will never know extinct species, which our children will never see. Thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. And so this quote represents uh, anthropocentrism in its valuing of the extinct species, not for their own view, but for that of two humans. Uh, Pope Francis, rather than mourning the loss of the species themselves, mourns the loss to we, or us, and our children, the loss of aesthetic value, recreational value, informational value. In addition, here we see the valuation of the divine rather than nature itself, as these natural objects give glory to God, showing their ultimate purpose, not for their own intrinsic worth, but for the divine. And so this is a key example of anthropocentrism. 
In another part of Laudato Si, uh, we see this part is about stewardship, and it reads, the freedom and responsibility of human beings, a fragile world entrusted by God to human care. And so here this is saying that stewardship uh, of the environment is not only a duty, but a display of human exceptionalism. As stewardship allows us as humans uh, to be free and responsible, it enables our moral agency. Uh, in addition, this quote represents how nature is being disenfranchised as rather than being empowered, it's called a fragile world entrusted by God to us. Moving to a legal text, so this is uh, regarding NEPA or the National Environmental Protection Act, which uh, requires federal agencies to conduct environmental assessments for their actions. And in describing the object of protection, lawmakers wrote that it is the human environment. Uh, this is defined as the natural and physical environment and the relationship of present and future generations of Americans to the environment. So rather than simply calling it the environment or nature or natural objects, uh, legislators point to specifically the relationship between the environment and humans, showing that it is our values and our relationship to the environment that matters. So for instance, if there were some forest somewhere that we didn't know about or had no relationship with, that would not be protected by NEPA in this rhetoric. Uh, NEPA also has other rhetoric like describing the environment as his environment or human's environment as a possessive way and calling things uh, like natural objects resources important to the nation. So this is directly citing the utility value that we gain from nature. So overall, we can see that both uh, Christian texts and legal texts that I studied do have a care for nature. So there is a concern for the environment and advocating for environmental protection. However, this is not only or not mainly motivated by an altruistic concern for the environment or the idea that nature has rights, but rather from an anthropocentrism and the interest that we hold for the environment. Uh, they come in different ways. So Christianity in its text has more of an emphasis on desacralization of nature and the idea that the divine owns nature, while the legal part has more of an interest as nature as property and with utility value. And so from my project, we can see that there is indeed nuance in attitudes towards environmental protection. It's not really cut and dry one or the other just advocating for the environment or just saying we should exploit everything. Uh, and this really reveals that there are further opportunities to explore the rights of nature in the United States with different religions, uh, different methods. So, thank you. Really wonderful work. Um, one question for you. How important do you see this um, idea of speaking for the trees, so to speak, in protecting the environment? Or do you think other solutions are actually going to be more effective? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question. And I think it really depends at the national level or really just the level that the legislation is enacted. So for instance, Ecuador is the prime example of this uh, as the rights of nature were implemented into its constitution in 2008. And so until the last year, it did have this rights of nature in the Constitution, but it was never really used effectively. And so it was sort of basically useless for uh, environmental protection and uh, exploitation of the Amazon continued. But then within the last year, due to a new case, that's changed. And so uh, it really, it depends on where it's implemented and the specifics regarding regulations. But it could have a huge impact. This was fantastic, Meili. Um, I'm having a bit of trouble phrasing my question, so maybe you can help me out with this. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of motivated by this thing that I'm noticing throughout your presentation, where it seems like, it seems like um, with the way the legal system treats value in general, a lot of it is fundamental utilitarian, and most of it is utility to the society as a whole. Um, and I feel like I even see that in the idea of giving nature rights by calling them persons or giving them personhood, right? Mm -hmm. We're valuing them the way we value people, but not necessarily the way we value nature as nature, which is not a person, but it still has value, even though it's not a person. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So can you speak a little more about what it would look like if in the legal system, the legal system was valuing nature for sort of its own intrinsic sake rather than for some other purpose? 
Sure. Yes. So uh, in terms of, I guess there are sort of two parts to your question. Uh, in terms of the personhood aspect, uh, this is because in part uh, you need nature to have an advocate. So like the Lorax, like obviously a river does not have a mouth. Well, it actually does have a mouth, but <laughs> it cannot speak for itself in that way. And so uh, sort of giving it personhood also facilitates ease of use with a guardian or a trustee being able to advocate for it on its behalf. And this is sort of similar to uh, other areas that use, in the rights of nature, one of the most famous texts is by Christopher Stone, Should the Trees Have uh, Standing? And he compares it to ch children having rights or corporations having rights where because they might not be able to speak for themselves effectively, you have a guardian or trustee. So in that way, uh, it would be for that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Would you see anthropocentrism as a, the only solution, I guess, in trying to convince people to, I guess, treat nature respectfully in this sort of human setting? Like, would it be more in it, would it help, would it help people, I guess, protect nature as opposed to an environment filled with toxic plants, for instance, that's inhabitable to, inhabitable to human, I guess, use, but, so would you say this is basically support for whatever supports the humans, not really poisonous things or whatever? Mm -hmm. For sure. I think it's really a double-edged sword in that, uh, like I mentioned, so anthropocentrism is not necessarily exclusive to environmental protection and environmental advocacy. And so like you're mentioning, it can be a very practical tool for like us to garner interest and say, hey, this affects us too, so we should protect nature. But uh, I guess if you were not to use anthropocentrism and rather uh, use ecocentrism or center the rights of nature, this could, it's really sort of like a different moral question, like I think Susan was mentioning of like, do you want, what is your ultimate moral goal? And so get, what would be the impact of getting humans to think about the packs in a different way and sort of not centering ourselves, but rather centering other objects in the world. And I think for this, we can really turn to potentially uh, indigenous sources of knowledge, uh, a future direction that I could not pursue, but potentially would in the future would be looking at Native American ideologies and texts regarding this as they're through my preliminary research, uh, those are much more likely to center a true harmony between humans and the environment and not really using as many anthropocentric views.